Hey everybody, glad you're with us. I'm Jason Sturm from The Edge Pro. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about another area where sharpeners call us all the time having issues. The plate itself, when we come to sharpening machines, doesn't matter the brand or the make, we have issues around the grid itself. And so we're gonna talk a little bit here and I'm gonna look at my notes. Uh, we're gonna call it grit management, the plate surface itself, and when it comes to blades, what hollow versus flat is. So number one, we're gonna look at the plate surface itself. And for those that don't truly understand what the tapered plate is, we're gonna do an extreme example. We're gonna pop this up into a cone so that we can see what that looks like. And I'm gonna take my straight edge, and if the camera can see this from that angle, when I lay this from what's representing from the center of the wheel to the edge, we should find a straight line. We should be down there. There shouldn't really be any light coming in and out from behind where the blade sits down onto that plate or in that straight line. That's indicating how we're gonna sharpen from tooth to tooth across the width of the blade. Now, we talk a lot about hollow grinding blades. And when we're hollow grinding, what we're ultimately trying to do is have positive pressure at the tips of the teeth to the comb. So as they marry to each other under that initial seating, that they're gonna have an even amount of pressure from tooth to tooth all the way across the width. The way we do this is that we have the taper to the plate and a natural reaction to that shape is that this outward bow to that surface creates a crown. And that crown we can see here was I rock the straight edge back and forth. So as that planes around, as we grind metal away, the center, if we're centered in this line, is gonna be deeper than what's out toward the tips. So when we take our blade that we're gonna sharpen, and we also put that center line at the center of the crown, now, as we go, that's going to create that positive, deeper cut in the center and shallower at the front and back, which ultimately means that the, they're gonna be taller at the very extreme positions away from that center line. And that's our hollow grind. So as we come in here and we move that following that center line, we end up with the hollow into our blade, which again is there for seating. Now that seating or that amount of hollow grind to that and how that crown is, is very slight, just a few micron from flat to where we actually have that positive result. So as it seats and we start at the tip or the metal is wearing to each other, marrying to each other, it's going to end up starting to flatten to each other. They're gonna really come in to where they match at least halfway to two thirds of the way down the tooth. All right, I'll get that out of the way. And we're gonna talk a little bit again, more about the grit itself. Now, how we apply, what materials we use, everybody has different ideas out there. And all I can talk to you about is our experience. Now we use a lard material, it's a stabilized lard uh, as our adhesive. Uh, in some cases, depending on climate, it's good to have that diluted, we call that spray adhesive, or we'll use straight lard. In our example, I'm gonna use straight lard. And I've got a plate that's already been charged. You can kind of see the look and color and feel to that. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off by cleaning this plate off. And the way I'm gonna do this process, it's a very efficient way to prep your plate for fresh grit. And I'm gonna use either a blade wash type material, a solvent, or I'm gonna use H42, again, that has a solvent to it. Now, the nice thing about H42, it has a disinfectant quality to it, along with uh, antibacterial, antiviral, and really, uh, it has a sweet smell compared to more of a petroleum scent. But we're gonna come up and we're gonna start in the center of the wheel with my brush, just to keep things really simple while it's running. I'm sorry, I do need to grab a paper towel because I don't want to throw all of this stuff everywhere. So I'm trying to not be in the way of seeing this, but I'm gonna set my brush down and it's gonna start cleaning. And it's breaking down our adhesive and cleaning the grid away. And my rag was catching some of the off fall. And I'm gonna just, now I have solvent on my plate still, so I'm gonna go ahead and dry that up. Now it doesn't need to be as clean as what we're gonna to wanna to eat off of it or anything like that, but we do wanna get the majority of the grit adhesive and now the solvent cleaned off. 
If I leave solvent, I'm going to dilute my adhesive that I'm going to put back on. Once I have the plate clean, it's going to feel nice and smooth. There's not grit buildup. We're really back down to the original surface of our plate. I'm going to let the brake slow us down quite a ways. I have another brush here that's loaded with the adhesive. Once I get down to where it's not going to sling too much in the air, I'm just going to again set it down and make a solid pass to the outside of the plate. Now there's always a question about how much adhesive with this type of material do I need. So we're going to look at this a little closer. Now that the plate's stopped, I've got an area toward the middle that reminds you of spin art when you were a kid, when they spun the piece of paper and you drip paint on it and it flings out. So we see those streaks. That's telling me I have too much material right there. And it's built up and it's kind of going to pool. Sometimes we call it fish eyeing even. Now in this outer part of the plate, we really don't see much of anything in the film. But when I run my finger across it, you can see that I do have a thin film of my lard. That's exactly what we're shooting for. We need a nice, thin, even coat. Now if I end up with a little too much in the middle and I don't want to waste grit, I'm going to just slightly dry that and pull that extra off. There's some different methods how we used to do this and they worked well uh, where we just put some on the plate and then we took a towel and wiped it everywhere. The issue was I kept running into inconsistencies because folks would use a nice clean rag every time and they would soak all the lard into their towel and not leave it on the plate. And we had a dry plate with no ability to hold the grit. All right, next would be, we're gonna, now that we have our adhesive on, we've dried up where it was a little excessive, I'm gonna take my grit, and in our case, again, there's arguments and or discussions around what grit to use. We need enough grit that it will actually be a benefit to our sharpening process. We need to create peaks and valleys in our surface, which helps us in that sheathing action. And so when we have the peaks and valleys and that initial wear along with the oil, we get a nice positive quick seeding. But anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put some grit out here. I'll just let the wheel turn slightly as I put it on. A lot of folks out there might say, well, that's way too much, too much grit. And I say, season to taste, right? I'm using my, my seasoning jar but I want enough grit that I actually am going to cover my entire surface and create my layer of aluminum to my blade with a separation of the grit. I don't want to make contact steel to aluminum. That's going to prematurely wear that surface. Once I have my grit laid out, I'm just going to take and I'm going to start making a swirl pattern, mixing the grit with the adhesive. And as I do that, it is changing color from more of my dark, dry color to more of a moist, wet, brown color. I'm just going to keep working to the outer edge. You will see some grit falling off the edge of my plate, kind of as waste. I would rather have a little waste than not enough. It is, the grit is much less expensive than the surfacing of the plate. And we want to see you send your plates in because they've actually worn due to volume, not because it was prematurely worn because we we're having contact to that surface. All right, so you saw I was doing that swirl pattern. You could hear it. The amount of pressure, how much pressure would I use with this rub block? Well, I always talk about it's similar to frying chicken in a frying pan, and now I'm trying to clean it up and I'm using my scouring pad. I actually want to put a little muscle into it. So I'm using three or four pounds of pressure as I push down, I'm not light, I'm not gentle. I'm not gonna damage the plane of that surface. What I do want to do is create swirl scratches, opening up the aluminum, allowing it to bond with the, my adhesive and my grit, and we have a nice coverage to what we're doing. If we can do that, we can do that grit management and we keep things going. One of the things that we've done with Nebraska Blades and our change in machining is we're getting a more true parallel surfaces from where the hub mount is underneath to our top surface that we're using. With that, we have less run out of our plates, less vibration, along with our balancing process, we have a very, very true surface. Uh, we use a variable speed uh, CNC lathe so that we're getting the exact same cut material removal from the center to the outer edge. 
which gives us a very, very accurate surface, along with the amount of time that we spend per pass. Uh, we've more than doubled what we used to do in the past. And with that, we get a very clean, very accurate surface. We've taken this into a testing lab, um, and we look for the, we get a topographic map about how that surface area is. And through those changes, um, our internal testing has more than quadrupled the number of blades we're getting in-house on a single side of a plate compared to what we used to recommend that would be time to flip our plates over. Uh, so again, overhead cost, when you get more blades to a surface, gives you more time uh, or less, get less cost per blade, right? And we're all about that because that puts more money in your pocket. Um, so we had grip management. Again, we also have to listen to the sparks. So we're hearing that grit and the removal and we're watching how big, bold, and strong our sparks are. Now, if you use a different machine and it runs slower, um, we're not going to have the heat generated by the abrasive action and you won't see sparks as bold as what we see here. Um, but when we come in, we expect to see nice strong sparks. And one of the questions we get a lot is, well, I've, I've put fresh grit on my plate, but I only get one or two blades and I don't seem to have any sparks anymore. Well, typically that means one of three things. One, not enough adhesive and our grit flew away. Not enough grit, so we have plenty of adhesive, but there's no grit there to be an abrasive. Or three, things we have not scoured our plate continually. We've actually burnished or built up a kind of a hard, slick surface on our aluminum, and our grit and adhesive just flies away as soon as we touch it. We will get some fly off still. I'm just going to come in, I'm going to touch this down. I want you to see the sparks that we're going to build. Now, as we come to the outer edge, we're going to get bigger, stronger sparks. But why would we have more sparks out of the outer edge to the center? Well, we have less feet per second the closer we get to our hub speed. Once we get out further, we have more feet per second, which means more friction, more spark, more heat. And so, again, when we come out, we'll see those bold fill in and we want to give our clean lift. So when we set down, we talked about this earlier, we're going to use the middle. We're going to make, on average, three passes. Our passes are there to use grit. I'm going to come into this outer half and I'm going to do that clean lift. We'll do that again. I'm going to set down. I'm going to do my travel path. Come out, 1001, 1002, clean. If you notice, when I came out to the outer edge and I stopped, there was kind of a hole in my sparks. As I counted my 1001, 1002, it filled in, everything was nice and clean, and then I had my lift. That's really indicating to me that I've got a nice clean grind. When I look at that surface, I'm hoping to see my scratch lines come, one, that they're parallel with my teeth and with my back rail. That indicates I'm centered in my crown of my plate. Now, the smaller diameter of the plate, the more curvature we could get in the back because we're coming around the arc, like on our CS10 models. We will see a slight angulation. But in general, we're going to see straight lines. And we talk about that those lines go to infinity through the cutting edges and tips. If we turn in the light and we pick up on shadows or we pick up on pins of light, that's telling us we still have damage or we have a secondary plane we've created. Um, most creative blade I ever saw had about five different planes going at once. And so that sharpener in training had to bring those all back together. Uh, sometimes again, if we get that far off, there's not enough material to fix it. So part of our grit management gets into then how many blades can we sharpen on that grit. Um, we have people that are, again, are anywhere from two or three up to more standard should be eight to 10. Uh, we typically do 10 to 12 on our surfaces. And if we can get to that 10 or 12, again, our time is better spent and uh, we're getting more use out of it. What's an argument around different materials with, uh, for adhesive? Um, one of them I do here out there uh, quite a bit is using WD-40. Again, it's a water displacement aid, uh, a slight lubricant, but it is not really designed to be a glue. Um, some people have some success with that. My concern with it is, is that as it dries, as it flashes off, that 
whether you even use it from the pump style to the aerosol, and the aerosols will dry faster um, because it has a propellant with it. Now we're leaving a dry powder with our grit, and if we walk away from the machine and come back, a lot of times we see a lot more fly off of that grit, and it doesn't stay. Um, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to damage that aluminum surface faster if we don't have good adhesion of our grit. So again, grit management is essential to plate life. And um, again, as we're doing that, I'll pull up just right now. Now, with this plate turned over about a week ago, and we're at 1,228 blades already on this side of the plate. The side that we flipped over from was at 6,200 sets. Now, will you get that result? I don't know. But if you can do have a properly surfaced plate, along with no runout and balance is clean, along with grit management, we can get those kind of results out of our plates. Um, the other thing that I had written down in this session had to do with hollow versus flat, and that gets into what we even discussed in our last class um, around our acronym with our four Ps, and one of those was placement and where we put a blade on the plate based on that crown. And if we look at that crown just again real quick, I have another example of what that crown looks like in an exaggerated fashion. We'll wait for our brake to kick in and stop our plate for us. Just take a few seconds. But when we go to do different styles of blades, not just our detachable style, we want to do trimmer blades or we want to do adjustable style, whether that be a five-in-one comb uh, from wall or any of the adjustables like an Andes Master, uh, we need some technique changes or we're going to have to change plates. So if you don't want to ever change your technique, you want to stay consistent all the way to the nth degree, we can always make you a plate that has a different taper to it. And those different tapers will give us a different result based on our placement, position, and pressure. But let's look here again. As we look at our plate surface, and this is an exaggeration of that crown, we are more shallow at, at the outer edge, and the closer we get to the center, we have more of a tight crown, more hollow that's going to be created with that. So our detachable blades, we use this outer half of the plate for our placement and position to give us a, the correct hollow grind. If we go to the center, we're going to have too much, which can cause damage to the tips of our comb and cutter rather than seat properly. Out here, we're going to get that nice seating. And we again, we've got some engineering tolerance, so it doesn't have to be any one specific spot, but we do need to be in that zone. If we're going to do a trimmer blade, where again, the component is much, much smaller, and we don't want to use that same pressure, which again, on those detachable blades, we're using about one and a half to one and three quarter pounds. Here, we're only going to use about a half to three quarter pounds. It's a smaller mass. And with that, under light pressure, is going to start flattening the grind. If anything, under um, a light pressure in this outer zone, we'll probably start losing the outer teeth. It's going to feather too quickly, and we're not even going to have teeth on the outside that are going to cut. So we're going to move in where there's more crown. Under light pressure, we're still going to get our hollow grind. And so it's an adaption of the use of the plate along with our pressure with a small component. So that's how we can do trimmer blades. Now if we go to the adjustable blade where, again, our surface needs to be functional for the cutter, whether the arm, the fade arm, is pushed to the close cut or we pull the arm back and we're in the back part of the tooth, we still need a nice ride surface on our comb for it to cut with. So we're going to come and do our regular sharpening like we do with a normal comb through our passes, get that wear material gone, and on the last pass out, we're going to drop our pressure to one pound. And again, this is on the Nebraska blade angles. There can be some variables to what your poundage is if you have a different taper. We still will come out toward the outer edge. And at this point, we've dropped our pressure to one pound. Our sparks died off slightly. And then as we do that, it's feathering. So again, we talk about mass. The center molecules are held more tightly than the ones on the edge. Think of a group of pencils. You put them in a bundle. You can snap off the outside ones really easy, but the ones in the core stay, and that's kind of how these molecules are held in the steel. So as we come out, we feather that. We get a, a better, more flat grind. We didn't have to change plates. We didn't change tapers. We just changed technique. 
with those things in mind, I hope that was helpful and happy sharpening.